has got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school. It's time for Pagan Perspectives, the show by and for Pagans, here on Block Talk Radio with your host, Reverend Sylvanus Treewalker of the Order of Standing Oak. If you're a tweeter on Twitter, follow us at Pagan Talk Show. All right, let's get on with the show. Good evening. It is Monday, and you are with me again for another episode of Pagan Perspectives. I'm your host, Reverend Sylvanus Tree Walker of the Order of the Standing Oak, and I hope you guys have had a great weekend. Mine was rather, 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 rather rainy and um, overcast and chilly. So yeah, it's getting to be that time. Everybody's out busy buying turkey and doing all this stuff for. Uh, through Thanksgiving holidays and stuff, so it's been kind of a madhouse around here, but it's good to be back here on the show. We've got a great show to talk about. We're going to talk about rituals and stuff tonight, and also we've got a great book for this week's Wiser Weekly, uh, Wiser Weekly Review, so there's a lot of things going on, and I just want to take just a quick minute and say hello to everybody in the chat room. We have Alarian. Guest 26634, guest 26933, JP Plank, Kat, and Tia. And if you're out there listening and you've never uh, listened to us before, all you got to do is if you'd like to join us here in the chat room and meet some really great people is come to www.blogtalkradio.com. Go about three-quarters of the way down the page on your uh, right. You'll see the uh, live chat list right there. You can click on uh, Pagan Perspectives, and join us in the chat room. And also, if you're wondering, when is the show? Well, we have three shows a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. here on Blog Talk Radio. And um, our Wednesday show is the show uh, The Way to the Grove, by and for the Druid community in the United States and around the world. And we've had, oh my gosh, we've had a, a smattering of some awesome interviews um, here lately. We've been having some really good shows. And... December and January are going to be cram-packed. So far, for the month of December alone, we've got eight interviews. So we are really going to be um, you know, just having a whole really good time um, with a lot of great people. We're going to talk about some of that here in just a minute. Um, for those of you that have never listened to the show before and wondering, well, what's the deal with Pagan Perspectives? Well… We have our web uh, presence here online. We have the official uh, Pagan Perspectives at Zanga.com web blog. And for those of you that are chained at the hip to Facebook, we have our official Pagan Perspectives on blogtalkradio.com, all one big word, official group, and we're getting bigger all the time. And also we have a sister group, which is for those of us that are left-leaning and liberal in our political outlook on things. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that is Progressive Pagans of America. So feel free to look us up and join in. We've got a lot of great people in there. The, some interesting things happen on you know during the week and stuff. So it's really really fun. Um, speaking of shows this week, we've got for the Way to the Grove show on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about Celtic cosmology. And then on Friday, for those of us that are activists out there in the world, we are going to be talking Pagans Who Occupy with Priestess Kate Tarrant, and we're going to be having a great show with her on Friday night from 6 to 8. And then coming up pretty soon, not too far off, on November 30th, it will be my pleasure to have author Raven Grimasi on the show, and we're going to be talking about his book, Old World Witchcraft, Ancient Ways for Modern Days. And i got to tell you guys – that um, if you would like to have a chance to win a copy of this book, now is the time to get your entry in. And if you're interested, all you got to do is send me an email to sylvanus93, that's S-Y-L-V-A-N-U-S 93, at hotmail.com. And in the subject line, put um, Old World Witchcraft, and all I need in the body of the email is a magical name for yourself and your mailing address. Also, we're going to have the authors of Wicca, What's the Real Deal, Breaking Through the Misconceptions, uh, Dana Winters, and um, she and her co-conspirators in writing this book will be with us here on the show on December 5th. 
So if you're interested in winning a copy of that book, put into the subject line, Wicca, what's the real deal? And then on December 12th, it will be uh, my pleasure to have, uh, once again, as my guest here on the show, uh, from Voices of the Sacred Feminine, we're going to be talking with Karen Tate. And for her show, we're going to have a giveaway of her book, Sacred Places of the Goddess, 108 Destinations. And if you're interested in winning that book, which is going to be two copies of that uh, given away, we're going to be uh, – just having a great show with her. Just got to do the same thing, magical name and your mailing address. And then, if that isn't enough, on uh, December 7th, we're going to have, for my guest on the show, author of – excuse me, got to grab the book right here – A Magical Tour of the Night Sky, Using the Planets and Stars for Our Own Personal and Sacred Discovery. Rena Shesso is going to be here on the show, and if you are – Interested in winning a copy of that book, in the subject line, put Magical Tour of the Night Sky, and we've just got so many more interviews that are going to be coming up. We're going to be having, on December 19th as my guest, uh, web uh, mistress of Green Egg Magazine, uh, the online version of the magazine. Sylvie Silu is going to be here on the show, plus we're going to have a great um, Yule show. It's just running and running and running. We're going to have a really uh, great month of December, and we've got some stuff coming up in January that as we get closer, I'm going to let you guys know about. But what we're going to do before we get into the show and start talking about ritual, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of music, and we'll be right back here on Pagan Perspectives. <laughs> Lavana, a circle is cast. And I just want to take just a minute to give a shout out and a great hello to Reverend Rob Henderson, Senior Druid of Shining Lakes Grove. And 
uh, I was holding off to play this on the uh, Way to the Grove show on Wednesday, which we're doing uh, talking about Celtic cosmology. But in honor of Reverend Rob being here, and it is a little bit past Salon, but I don't care. I still love this song. Um, and he'll have to tell me who the guitarist is again, but I love it. What the heck? Before we get into the show, I've got to play it. This is Zombie Song from Shining Lakes Grove, ADF, and Rob Henderson here on Pagan Perspectives. All right. This, this, is, a, this is a story inspired not just by Sow and Rituals Past, but all the many rituals where I've heard people try to sing but not really for the various chants and offerings. So I envisioned it as more of a uh, George Romero movie, if you will. So there's an audience participation part towards the end, so hopefully you'll join in for that one. It's Samhain again, it's the holiday when the veil between worlds becomes thin. And the land of the dead opens up, so it's said, and the spirits all find their way in. So to honor our guests at our ritual fest, let's offer them lots of good food. Giving ghosty to ghosties will make us good hosties and show our hospitable mood. <laughs> We're still working on the tune here, sorry. Now the ancients adore when you tell their folklore, praise their wisdom and courage and truth. And to honor your kin, to beckon them in, you can sing them the songs of their youth. But make sure to sing loudly and brightly and proudly when calling the dead to be near. You must fight off your urges to sing off key dirges, or the wrong dead will hear. <laughs> <laughs> the zombies are coming to Samhain tonight. Your half-hearted droning and minor key toning invited them here to our right. Some <laughs> rotting undead cannot simply be fed by offerings of incense and grain. Know their hungers for you and they just want to chew and devour your brains. brains. No! Flash! I said they were Romero zombies. Have you not done your research? <laughs> <laughs> Having zombies Dead in our circle instead of our ancestors would be quite odd. Can they open the gates where they think Norman faces is a hero, or is he their god? For the Earth Mother called if their fingertips fall on the ground. Is that just like their healing? Would the waters of life put an end to their strike, or would it just leave them reeling? <laughs> the zombies are coming to Samhain tonight. Their shambling gates, they really can't wait to take part in our festival night. They won't be perturbed by your screams or disturbed by the cold or scared off of it rain. They're determined to be part of our company and to plant their teeth in our <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, this terrible curse, it would be even worse than a blizzard or thunder and lightning. When they stand around moaning and mumbling and groaning, we'll all find it quite a bit frightening. So remember, if you use a musical cue to honor your gods or your kids, you must give it your all or your wishy-wash call will mean that the zombies are in. The zombies are coming to town. But we may got the boat, so we must be good hosts, even though it may cause us some pain. Even though we won't live, we must offer to get Oh, go ahead, just say it. Rain! There we go. Get the info. That was brought to us by Reverend Rob Henderson, Senior Druid of Shining Lakes Grove, ADF, and some great people, and Miss Mitchie, Missy Birchfield on the guitar. I love it. I love Circle Songs. That was so awesome. And you are listening with me tonight here on Pagan Perspectives, uh, the show by and for the Pagan community here on Blog Talk Radio. And tell your friends, get them to join us here on the show. 
uh, come into the chat room, www.blogtalkradio.com. And if you have any questions or you want to add to the discussion tonight on the show, the number to call is 714-364-4316. And tonight we're talking about rituals, uh, what they are and why we have them. Now, there's been millions of, of, of books and, and lectures and, and all kinds of things about you know the the sabbats and and different rituals for the many different <clears throat> excuse me traditions and you know we know a lot of the of the uh you know the reasons behind some of the things we do but then again some people that are new into paganism or are uh you know it takes a little while to understand things i think this is the show that's kind of kind of uh, address some of the issues for people that don't necessarily, <clears throat> excuse me, understand what the what the deal is behind a lot of the things that we do. And uh, the, the, now somebody says, well, uh, you know, rituals and, and spells—they're the same thing. Well, yes, there is there are ritual elements and spells and magic and things like that, but there are rituals, <clears throat> excuse me, that do not. Do not actually go to a hundred percent concentration on a magical level. Like whenever you're you're wanting to do something for someone or yourself, whenever you're spell working um, and things like that, you know that's a hundred percent or as much of a, a close to a hundred percent concentration on doing what you want to do as possible. But rites and rituals that are involved in paganism, there's a lot of times that they aren't necessarily uh, focused to that degree, and there are the, the the kinds that we have. There are rites of honoring, honoring the ancestors, uh, honoring those that have uh, gone on before. Uh, you know that kind of thing. There are rituals that are uh, supplications to the gods, saying you know things haven't been so great. Um, you know, could you send some good luck my way, or what have you, without actually working a full spell? There are ways, that, or, or working a full magical operation. There are ways to work within a, within a ritual setting that doesn't require 100% uh, ritual focus. And one thing is like supplication to the gods, and that's the way a lot of it was in you know ancient times. Uh, you know, there were the priests that were in the temples and the groves that did. 99% uh, of the magical work for the tribes, but then there were priests that all they did were uh, make supplications to the gods night and day saying, oh man, help us, you know, we're in trouble or whatever. Or on the other side, there were uh, rituals of uh, praising the gods for what they did. If uh, a group or a clan or a tribe or what have you went into a neighboring uh, province and had some great raids, and they brought back all kinds of gold and, and furs and things that the, that their people needed. Those were uh, uh, there were rituals that were done, celebrations that were done uh, to honor the gods for bringing them back in one piece, um, for you know the riches that they brought back, and also sometimes there were parts uh, and uh, rites within rites. See, a lot of times, uh, you know, we think that everything is just one big, you know, one big circular deal whenever we do a ritual. But whenever you break it down, and that's one thing I think people need to learn and to think about is to break the, the ritual down uh, into its smaller components. And each of those smaller components are rights unto themselves. Um, in a Wiccan setting, uh, just the, the act of of, um, of casting a circle. Um, people think, well, you're just casting a circle for the ritual, but that's a rite unto itself. Whenever you're foc focusing the energy uh, to, you know, erect the temple uh, in your uh, tradition's fashion, that is a ritual in itself. Um, the ritual of the procession of people coming to the grove or coming to uh, the, the the circle site, that is a rite unto itself. Um, the uh, entrance into uh, the, the sacred space is a right unto itself. You know there are uh, many different uh, ways of doing it, but each one of those is a right unto itself. Um, for those that are involved in Wiccan tradition, that uh, call the uh, elemental watchtowers, 
and things like that, those are rights to themselves. So whenever you know, whenever we go and uh, uh, you're not really simplifying it, but you're looking at it, each one of its components, component parts, it's it's very involved. All pagan rituals, whether it's Druidic, um, you know, Wiccan, generalized pagan, there are many things to think about um, what we're doing. And you know the, the the people that I always get these people that say, well, I will participate in a ritual per se, you know, the ones that will you know stand and sing and drum and what have you, but as far as you know doing anything else within the circle, they're afraid because this is one of the I don't know if it's an excuse, but I I can understand it coming from people that are new, or that don't really know a whole lot. I get this a lot of times, and the people saying, well. I'm afraid to do anything because I'm afraid that I might mess it up. Well, I'm one of those people, and I don't know about you. I'm one of those people that highly believes that anything – excuse me – that you do in circle, um, whenever you're of a, you know, of a sound mind and you're not doing anything necessarily malicious, if you flub up and knock a candle off of the altar or you accidentally knock the grove's cauldron over… Or something like that, you know. The gods aren't going to smite you over the head with a great big thunderbolt. Um, it will, you know, it can make a good for a good laugh. And the thing right there is, if you do do something of that is, you know, kind of off the beaten track in the ritual. Well, one thing you've learned right then and there is, you know, try not to do that again. And also, a lot of covens and groves and groups, they get people involved early. I mean, they'll get you in once you get into the door, and they you say that I want to study with your group. They they don't let you just go through you know a year's worth of classes and then finally have you become involved. There are groups, and I think this is a good thing. It gets through that shell shock period. That's good that they uh, get you involved right away. And what that does is it kind of forces you to face up to any fears that you might have. Of working in a ritual setting, and the one thing is once you can get confident in what it is that you're doing, um, you become more effective in it. If you're the person that uh, sets up the altar and gets its energy going uh, for whatever uh, ritual purpose that you have, you learn to focus your energy. You learn to work with the altar. Um, you learn to um, bring it into a place where it's ready for – its application within the context of your rite and ritual, and you know the people that are good at it, once they find their niche in what they do, they add a lot to the ritual. That's one thing, like the, the differences in rites and rituals. Um, as an example, between Wicca and, say, Druid uh, practices, one thing that a lot of people may recognize and may not recognize that a lot, and I'm saying not Every single one, but a lot of – well, okay, we'll go eclectic as compared to traditional uh, witchcraft practices compared to a lot of, of the regular uh, Celtic American and, and other forms of Druidry that we know in the United States. The Wiccan ritual, the witchcraft rituals tend to be um, shorter. Um, they tend to have less elements involved. Now – that doesn't mean that are, any are more complicated or uncomplicated than another. It just, seem, it just seems like that on one side of the board and the other, the witchcraft and wicked rituals tend to be a little bit shorter, um, tend to have a different focus compared to a lot of druid ritual. Druid ritual tends to be – doesn't always – uh, you know, meet the mark, but that depends on the tradition that you're working with. Tends to be large group oriented. Uh, tends to be more inclusive. In other words, uh, a lot more uh, participation and action involved by people in the circle, instead of just having like one or two people that call the quarters, uh, one or two people that invoke this god or this goddess or this spirit or what have you. There's a lot more to it. Um, but that's by design because uh, a lot of groups, ADF, Hengikeltria, um, Obod, and stuff like that, um, for the holy days, for the four uh, high holy days, there tends to be a lot more people at them. I mean most Wiccan covens can get together maybe 9, 10, 15 people 
for a good ritual. This is on average. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But then you look at some of the Druidic rituals that go on in the United States and around the world. You can have 30, 40, 60 people. So uh, it, it seems like also within a, a lot of the Druidic rituals and rites, there tends to be a lot more of a of a pageantry thing. Um, more there's there's more stuff. There's more things to attune to, but it doesn't mean that there isn't that in Wicca. It just it tends to be that way. And I think the one thing on either side the deal for rites and rituals is not necessarily the performance of the rites and rituals. Whenever we do it, if it's a full moon, if it's a new moon, if it's an esbat, if it's a high holy day, if it's an initiation or what have you, it's not so much of what the ritual is going to be, but its effect. Its effect on our mind, its effect on everybody else that we are uh, – in, in circle or in sacred space with, and I think that's what a lot of people that are new don't understand is it's not the trappings of you know standing in robes and chanting and you know hearing the words of the high priest and priestess. It is that, but it it's how it affects us. It's how we connect with the gods. It's how we connect because through all the things that are going on, all of these elements that are going on in the circle. You know, we are in a group of people. We are sharing energy in whatever ap application that we're doing, whether it's an esbat or what have you. But when, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever it comes down to it, for us, this is our spirituality. This is what how we connect with the gods, and we are the thing that's so cool about it is that we have the opportunity to do that and and experience that with other people. I think another thing is that whenever we are involved in ritual that involves more than just ourselves, um, I'm not saying that solitaries cannot experience the same thing, but I think one thing that uh, we do a little bit more so than a solitary might possibly do is we absorb the energy of those that are around us. We absorb the energy of the place we are where we are holding the ritual, and it's all of these things. These are the things that build us up. Have you ever noticed um, – you know, you're getting yourself into that ritual mindset. Um, everything's together. You've got things going, and then those people that are facilitating the ritual say, "Okay, it's time. Let's go do this." You go out. You make your processional to your ritual site. You come into your sacred space. You go through the body of the ritual. You close, and then you have your recessional where you leave and you go back and and you know chat and visit and do whatever it is that you do after a ritual. One thing that I've noticed. <clears throat> Excuse me. For me, is after ritual, um, you kind of have this heightened sense of things. Um, you know, having come out of space where you are communicating with the gods and the ancestors and the spirits of time and place, we get kind of a heightened awareness, which is important. We need to to know how to recognize that, and our senses, our our five senses, kind of get heightened, and our spiritual senses kind of get. Um, uh, supercharged as well. Um, one thing you got to be very careful about, though, uh, in ritual situations, is sometimes in where there's been ecstatic dance, a lot of drumming, and things like that. You can get ritual high, and it can be a bad thing. So one of my things is my biggest thing that I tell people is after every ritual, regardless of your tradition, if you have those inclinations. Of feeling, you know, the 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 over over energized, the the over hyped thing of the ritual. Then what you should do before you do anything else is ground off some of that energy. One thing that I do is um, as I leave the site, I will ground into the earth. Or if that doesn't work, whenever I get back to the house or wherever it is that we're doing at Covenstead or what have you, is I run my hands under water. Turn on this, turn on this uh, faucet, and just let the water carry that energy out through my hands and away from my body. And also, of course, you know, other than the fact that a lot of um, rituals involve cakes and ale or some kind of ceremonial libation and uh, eating of bread or cakes or whatever, sometimes even that isn't enough to um, kind of quell some of that. So it's a good idea if you can. 
once you get back to wherever it is that you're going after the ritual to kind of eat a light snack or something. And that doesn't mean, you know, go whole hog on um, a full rack of ribs and mashed potatoes and, and all that kind of stuff. You want to go light. And also, through all ritual situations, since we are conductors of energy, I cannot stress this enough, um, before, during, well, before and after, at the very least, um, you want to drink a little bit of water because water is what keeps our energy in our body going. We're fluid creatures on the inside. And so, yeah, and if you can, uh, avoid lots, a lot of alcohol before ritual. That's one thing. Respect your rituals too. I've been to some rituals where the priests and priestess were just awesome people, but there were people that didn't get the gist of what things were going on, what they were supposed to be. And you know, they uh, there was one guy that came to a ritual that kind of knew our group, but he had been back and forth and he hadn't really participated in much of anything, you know, a couple, two, three rituals, so he didn't really know the whole, you know, gamut of what went on with our group. And he came and he wasn't shit faced drunk, but he was buzzed enough where you could tell um, his focus was taken away, and that's one thing you've got to be careful with too. Whenever you're working rituals that um, – where you're raising a cone of power or if you're drawing down the moon or drawing down the sun or whatever uh, aspect that you're doing, you that is something where you have to be mindful of who comes into circle. Those are situations where um, somebody has to say, we can't do like this because you know that one person with that kind of – you know. Physicality, the, the the over over libated person, let's put it that way, can be the little linchpin that gets unplugged and can uh, maybe not necessarily kill uh, the ritual situation, but it can make it a lot, you know, a, a lot less than what it's desired. That's why for those of us that are that are of the of the the tradition that perfect love and perfect trust, you know. Open circles are great, but sometimes you have to know when to say that for a ritual situation, you've really got to – and this falls on priest and priestess. And if you're a priest or a priestess of a group or a grove, this is where your judgment comes in and allowing people that are a little bit too tipsy or have smoked themselves up really bad. And you know, it's like these people are the ones that can detract or derail a good ritual situation, and… So we have to learn when to uh, kind of get these people off to the side and say, hey, you, you, you might want to just hang out and kind of – you know, you can watch and stuff, but for what we're trying to do, we don't need that kind of energy in circle. And be diplomatic about it. Don't be mean to the guy. Um, now, some people have – I've been to rituals where there have been people that just had no idea, were totally shit-faced, and they were asked to step out of circle, and they got irate about it. And that happens too. Every people are different. Our our emotional statuses, our, our peace, our you know, our personal mind thing. We don't know how they're going to be. But you know, that situation. A couple of the older gentlemen that were there at the place just helped the guy. It took him around to the front of the house, called a cab, poured him into the cab, and sent him on his way. And you know, that's the way you deal with it because that's one thing that we don't need is you know people coming to our rituals. And then, you know, getting attacked for something. I mean, you know, we have to be tactful in the way that we handle people. And this is some of the reasons why um, we have rituals is to come together. And, you know, I think the people that come into the situations where they might a little be a little bit off could be a test from the gods. It's like, how are you going to handle, um, you know, this situation? And, you know, we, we are tested as priests and priestesses, and any other person that has uh, an office or station within a traditional covenant or grove, you know, there are going to be situations that are going to test your metal. They're going to push you to the limit, and if you strike through it and everything, you're doing very good. Um, and you got to figure now with specifically, um, let's say, let's go to the larger ritual situations of like a juridic ritual. There's a lot to Consider there's a lot of people that are there that you're wanting to keep the ritual uh, flowing in all of its elements, whether it's um, the omen or any tree meditations. You want everything to flow, 
And by flowing, it takes us through those levels. You know, there's those levels of power, those levels of energy that are felt by us from the very minute that once, for those that are witches, once the circle is sealed, um, you know, you go through the right, and it just it, – you feel it. You sense it. You can smell it. You can feel it in the wind. You can hear it in the chanting. You can see it in the eyes of your priest and priestess as they move about the circle doing the things that they do. Um, a lot of times we don't we, – we focus so much on the form of ritual, all the flowery words and things that we don't take the time <coughs> – excuse me – to – be human with it to feel what the ritual really is about, and we're going to talk about some of that tonight in individual ritual styles, individual rituals themselves. How do we connect? How do we? How does the energy change from one particular rite to the next? And yeah, we're going to be talking about just all some really good stuff tonight about uh, rituals and rites. And if you have any questions or if you want to add. Um, your expertise about some things that you've experienced in a ritual setting, then please uh, feel free to call the number 714-364-4316. And if you're out there and you haven't joined us, I highly recommend that you come and join us here in the chat room, www.blogtalkradio.com. Tell your friends about the show, and we're going to give you guys a little bit of spiral dance. This is Woman of the Earth here on Pagan Perspectives. Down. 
powerful, spiritual, uplifting, connected, music that makes you want to dance and feel the rhythm of the earth. This is Kiva, and you are listening to Kiva here on Pagan Perspectives. We are so proud to have Kiva Music here on the Pagan Perspective show here on Blog Talk Radio. And we encourage you to go to their website, www.kivasong.com, and check out more of their music and support them. Also, if you feel so inclined, and I highly encourage you, please feel free to book them for your events and uh, look for them here on the show. We hope to have an interview with them. So remember, Kiva Music is here on Pagan Perspectives. They go to www.kivasong.com Yes, yes, yes. We are so glad to have Kiva here on the show. We've got their music. We love them a lot. Um, And to kind of recap on some stuff uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier, like I say, we have a bunch of great shows coming up. And I want to kind of give you the heads up of who some of them are. On Wednesday's show, we're going to be talking about Celtic cosmology on the way to the Grove. On Friday night, we're going to have Priestess Kate Tarrant here talking about pagans who occupy, pagans and the Occupy movement here in the United States. Um, also, we've got a lot of them coming on November 30th. Be here. You don't want to miss this show. We're going to be, t- be talking with author Raven Gramasi about his new book, uh, uh, Old World Witchcraft, and then on December 5th, we'll be talking with Dana Winters of Isis Paranormal. We're going to be talking about her book, Wicca, What's the Real Deal? Breaking Through the Misconceptions. On uh, uh, December 7th, it will be my pleasure to have as my guest Rena Shesso, author of A Magical Tour of the Night Sky, uh, Into the Planets, uh, Use the Planets and Stars for Personal and Sacred Discovery, and this book is awesome. I've gone through the first couple of chapters in it, and there's so much information. It's not just a book on pagan astrology per se, but there's just so much lore and connections to the gods. And I'm going to tell you what. This book is – it's average. It's about 200 and something pages, but I'm telling you, you're going to be going over it very slowly, and a lot of it will go into some of your journals. A lot of it will be used. There are tarot spreads. There are things for ritual. There are connections with constellations that you wouldn't have thought that were there. So that's definitely a book that we're going to be uh, putting out there for people to win. Also, we're going to be talking with author uh, Karen Tate and um, host of Voices of the Sacred Feminine here on um, Blog Talk Radio on the show December 12th. And then on December 19th, it will be my pleasure to have as a guest the webmistress of the Green Egg E-Zine. Uh, here on the show, we're going to be talking about uh, her involvement with the Pinnacle Project. Uh, we're going to be talking about Green Egg. Um, we're going to be talking about the possibility of Green Egg going from an online uh, uh, e-magazine back to a real magazine format. Um, I'm one of those people that has have I have a stack of pagan magazines from Circle Magazine to Green Egg to Connections to New Eon Magic, to uh, you know, just all the good pagan magazines that are out there. And don't get me wrong, I like uh, the media that you can find on the interweb, but sometimes it's good to be able to turn off the computer, kick back in your favorite recliner with a cup of tea or whatever it is you like to drink, and sit there with a, with a magazine and actually read and you know get to see what's going on in our community that's why i'm hoping that you know even though we have this bad economic time in the country that we can get back to having you know great newsletters and speaking of which we're going to do a little something uh that i haven't uh done here on the show if you are a person that is part of a coven grover group and you have a newsletter and you would like to promote your uh newsletter then send me an email to Sylvanus93, S-Y-L-V-A-N-U-S-93. And if you have a uh, JPEG of a picture of what your newsletter looks like, or if you have a little bit of a uh, snippet from it if you don't want to send the whole thing, or if you're able to send it as per se like an office file, 
definitely send it because we want to start promoting your covens and groves through your newsletters, and we'll get you know people that can you know get a hold of you, and you can start sending out your uh, newsletters to more people. Also, uh, for those of you that have the spirit of the bard in you, and I'm really looking to up the ante on this thing. Um, if you are a person that is poetic, that is creative in, in your writing and things like that, we want to focus on you here on the show. And what I mean by that is if you're a person that writes poetry, stories, or songs, excuse me, we want to uh, share those with our listeners here on the show. How do you do that? You send me an email to sylvanus93 at hotmail.com, and you can send it as a word file or what have you as far as your uh, poem story. Uh, or song, or you can put it in the body of an email. One thing I ask, though, is you make sure that you send a magical name for yourself and the title of things. Um, and for those of you that have a microphone and know how to uh, edit audio into an MP3 format, we would love to get some of your, your poetry and songs and stories told by yourself, you know, to, you know, to hear you uh, tell it from your perspective and, and stuff would be awesome. And we, you can send multiple submissions. The only thing that I ask is two things. A, no submissions from people that are from others. In other words, if you see somebody else's poetry and you lift it as your own, don't do that. That's not nice. Also, established writers like uh, Chaucer and, and Waite and William Blake and stuff like that, don't plagiarize other people's work like that. Want it original, pagan themed. And if you have a story that you would like to read um, yourself and do it as an MP3, one thing that I ask though is if it's like, say the story turns out to be 20 minutes, please cut that file in half if you can and send it in two segments, two 10-minute segments. That way we don't go too long into a show, and it gives us more of a chance to um, showcase you through two different shows. And you know, for anybody that sends us say five poems, we'll do one poem per show. And I like to be able to do a poem or a story or a song through all three shows of a week, but we just haven't been having people do that. But if we can get at least two or three a week that people will send in, it would be really cool. And some of it we may go ahead and um, focus on and, and, and put out towards people on our Facebook page since now Facebook doesn't have – um, a writing limit you know, on what you can type, so we may uh, focus on some there. And also for those of you that are uh, wondering about our web presence, we also have our official paganperspectives.weebly.com, W-E-E-B-L-Y. We've got our Weebly page, and we've got a marketplace there. We've got forums and the uh, – what do you call it? The widget for this show so that you know people can listen through that page. So yeah, so please, if you have a story or a poem or a song that is uh, written by yourself, please submit it, and we'll get it here on the show. I would really like to see um, the talent that is out there in the pagan community. Tonight we're talking about rituals, and if you have a question or you want to make a comment about what we're talking about uh, ritual-wise, the number to call is 714-364-4316, and we're going to go down here for a quick second. And we'll be right back. It's time for the Wiser Weekly Review here on Pagan Perspective. This week and every week we will talk about a wiser author and a book and give you guys a chance to win. This is your chance to learn about what's going on in the pagan writing field and beyond here on Pagan Perspectives. All right, and we've been doing this for quite a little while now. Uh, we're coming up on several, several, several weeks of doing this, and what we do is on Monday nights, we get together and we talk about a wiser uh, author and book, and tonight this book is incredible. It's awesome. It is Rediscovering the Celtic Moon Goddess, Queen of the Night by Sharon McLeod McMaka, and oh my gosh, this book is beautiful. We have… Uh, chapters talking about uh, the goddess. We have uh, exercises of, of dealing with the goddess, um, places where there are uh, indications of goddess worship and things in the Celtic Isles, the, the, the concepts of the moon goddess, and so on and so forth. This book is just packed for anybody that is into uh, Rhiannon, 
and you know, the Welsh uh, aspects of the moon goddess and things like that. This book is just incredible. Um, it's I'm past 250 pages, and I'm still going. You know, this book is about 270 pages, and it is just – it's incredible. It's This is one of those books, like I say, that you want to kick back with a cup of tea and really get into. And the exercises and things that are in here for um, dealing with um, uh, you know, the – uh, goddess, like there's one chapter I just opened it up to. It's called Hinges, Barrels, and Cairns: The Moon in British and Irish Prehistory. So not only does it talk about the goddess, but it also talks about um, the moon as well. So, and we are going to do a, a series of shows. We're going to do a show about uh, being ruled by the moon, and we're going to do a, a show about being ruled by the sun, and the things that go along with moon moon goddesses and sun gods and the whole thing. So. I thought, what the heck? This would be an awesome book to, you know, give uh, our listeners a chance to um, get a hold of and have it in their library. Uh, you know, as any of the books that we put out by uh, Wiser are really, you know, really scholarly, and a lot of them are just incredible books. And so, you know, tonight we're going to give one of you lucky people out there a chance to win it. And what we'll do is we'll announce it tonight. And then Wednesday we'll announce it again, and we'll have it put up on the Pagan Perspectives on blogtalkradio.com page. And then on Friday night we will announce the winner. And all you got to do is if you want a chance to win this book, Queen of the Night by Sharon McLeod Nickmaka, is send me an email, Sylvanus93, S-Y-L-V-A-N-U-S-93, at hotmail.com. And in the subject line, put Queen of the Night. All I need after that is a magical name for yourself and your mailing address, and we'll get it out to you. Also, um, to everybody that's won books, I keep getting – it's so cute. I keep getting little emails and messages on Facebook going, guess what? Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I finally got the book and all this. And I'm like, I'm really glad that you guys are finally getting them. They're getting to your uh, mailboxes and things like that. Now, we have had a couple of people that have won books and things here in the last couple of weeks that haven't received them. And I'll tell you this. This is what – I've got it straight from the horse's mouth, basically, that um, once winners are announced here on the show, I get a hold of the people at Wiser, and they tell me that it takes about five to ten days to uh, get the books to you. Now, sometimes you got to realize the books are shipped media mail. Excuse me, and it can take a little bit longer, but not by much. You know, if it takes four weeks or whatever, it's kind of sad that you had to wait that long. But then again, I still get these emails and things like, "Oh, thank you so much. I wish I could hug you and stuff. This is an awesome book." And that's what we do. You know, that's one of the reasons why uh, Wiser wanted to step up and help sponsor the show because they have some great authors, some great books, and we're bringing them to you with a bunch of great uh, interviews. And things like that, and that's kind of what the thing that helps this show go and go and go, and the reason why we're able to be here with you tonight. Um, okay, like we, we've been talking about ritual, and I think we need to go towards some of the uh, you know, different designations of ritual and what our responses to them are. And this is for – we're going to go kind of talk for a minute to the people that are priests and priestesses within traditions. Um, covens, groves, and groups, and the first type of rituals that we were going to talk about for a minute are what I call service rituals. Service rituals are uh, baby blessings, wickenings, um, house blessings, um, anything that has to do with something that serves our clan or tribe, um, whether it's in the beginning of life or the ending of life, and this is the stuff that I – Really, this is the stuff that I'm really prepared for. Excuse me, because of the fact that you know you have people out there that recognize us um, as their priests and priestesses within these different traditions, and they know that you know whenever they have something going on in their life that they can come to us and we can serve them the way that we are. That's the one thing that I believe pagans and, and Wiccans and, and witches and druids, we're not here just to get together and dance around the bonfire. We're here to serve and help take care of each other and take care of the earth, and that's why we do the things that we do. And you know, the one thing that I get the most 
you know, enjoyment out of is seeing how people react to, uh, you know, whenever there's a baby blessing. That is just one of the coolest things, you know, baby blessing or a hand fasting or whatever it is that you're doing. These are life changes that are important to people, and you get to be a part of it. You know, I've seen some people that have literally been asked to perform a hand fasting or a wickening or whatever it is that they're doing, and um, you know, they they get kind of uh, complacent about it. It's like, oh, I was asked to do this, I was asked to do that, you know, and. I'm one of those people that whenever somebody asks me to do a hand fasting or a baby blessing or a house uh, blessing or whatever, I love it. I mean, I think it's an awesome opportunity to help people out. And you know, it doesn't happen every day. I mean, I know there are uh, you know priests and priestesses of various traditions that are swamped with a lot of different um, things like that. Uh, you know, because we do end up becoming counselors and other things like that, and that's what we're here for. If you, you know, if you, if you're going in that direction as a priest or priestess, um, you're going to have to know the things that you're going to that you're going to be asked to do. And that's another reason why ritual is really important that you stay on top of things that you are practiced in what you do. Because doing half ass that's another thing. Rituals are something that are important. You know, if you are in a ritual and you get fidgety, specifically for a person that's just attending, you're not actually having any kind of part within a ritual, but you're standing there and you know it's you're not used to it or whatever's going on, and you know you get people that get fidgety, and it's like they start looking at their watch and they start looking around like they'd rather be somewhere else. Well, then maybe that's not the group to be with for you, or maybe paganism isn't for you because, you know, whenever ritual becomes a chore, or when ritual becomes something that isn't enjoyable to you, or it, you know, in, in some fashions, I know people do have bad days, but just in general, then you know, it just might not be the right thing for you because of the simple fact that we shouldn't be clock watching whenever we're worshiping, you know. That's not giving the gods the best of our attention. It's not giving the spirits of place and our ancestors and things the best of ourselves. And you know, uh, to to practice at something because rituals are practices that we are things that we do uh, in, in a repetitive manner. A lot of times, that's where you get traditional rituals, um, where you have covens and groves that do the same thing for uh, uh, you know uh, Esbat. Full moon, new moon, their Sabbaths and things like that. Or you have the opposite side of the spectrum, which is the eclectic side, where every single ritual that a group does, and this has happened, every single ritual is different. They never do the same ritual twice, and uh, you know, from each time that you attend, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Now, the thing for me that kind of messes that situation up is if you are so utterly eclectic in your practice that your coven doesn't even know what you're going to be doing from one ritual to the next, it gets chaotic. It gets people unfocused, um, and how can you practice a truly, utterly, 100 percent eclectic tradition when you don't know what it is, You know, when there's nothing that – there's no glue that binds it together? That's why tradition… Um, rituals that have a tradition or have a, a set pattern of doing things is the glue that can keep people together. Um, you know, there there is a bound of reason of how much you can uh, stray in in an eclectic situation, and how much you can uh, you know not want to stray in a traditional coven, because there are like Gardnerian covens and Alexandrian and certain other ones that they literally. Um, do the same thing over and over and over again, and whenever you do the same thing over and over and over again, that becomes boring as shit. You know, people don't want to because they know there's nothing there that sparks the imagination. There's nothing there that can spark their psychic centers. You know, it's just it's always the same thing. So there's got to be that balance, and there are traditional covens, groves, and groups that work within a framework. They work within the framework of their tradition. They will work within a Gardnerian mindset. They will work with they will work within an Alexandrian mindset. But they're not afraid to take that structure, which ritual is a structure. It's a house. 
and what you decide to furnish that house with is what gives it character. Um, you know, there are there are way, different ways to do different sections of the rituals that you know will change things around, but still follow the letter of what you're trying to do with the house, how you're trying to fill it, and it makes people comfortable. It makes people, you know. Realize that hey, this is a good ritual. They won't be standing around looking at their watch and wanting to be someplace else, because I mean I've been to some rituals that were just so monotone and it was just so much the same thing. And you know that if you're a person that goes into a ritual situation with the idea of I'm going to do my part to add to it, because that's an example of adding to ritual um, in a positive way is your part. What goes on during a uh, raising of power, cone of power? You know, if you're dancing around and people are chanting and you're raising that energy, and if you aren't putting your part into it, if you're just kind of off in la la land, it can affect the power that is raised. It can affect the rest of the circle. You know, but if you tune in, if you get that group consciousness, the group mind. Um, and also as a solitary, you can do the same thing. You know, you don't want to be lackluster. You want to, you know, really focus and work towards your goal of what you're doing by raising the power. Then, you know, you're going to get a lot more out of it. Ritual. There are even just by simple celebratory rites. You know, we have the sabbats. You know, for the seasons and things. You know, there are there are things that happen. After we're through, after we've stepped out of circle and, and you know gone in to have the potluck and whatever happens, there are things that are set in motion that we don't often think about. There are things that um, we start to realize once you know a few days after the ritual has gone by, and you start to see things um, like let's say that you're going from autumn, like we are now, to winter. We are knowing that we're going to be shut up a little bit more. We're not going to be out in the world as much. For those of us that tend to be sedentary and, and you know like to go inward and study and be crafty and do things, but then again, for some people that you know they're not really into it during the summer and fall, they become more active in the winter. You feel that. You feel those changes. The 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 the, the, the rituals, the ritual times signal things. Your psychic mind goes, whoa. This is what's happening next. This is the cycle, and that's what we strive for within paganism. Even for new people, this is what you strive for. If you're a teacher, if you're a coven, uh, a person that helps new folks, um, those that are just now dedicating or working towards their first initiation or whatever, this is the kind of thing that you want to instill in your students. And uh, you know the the importance of what the ritual is. That's why the service rituals are important. Then we have the rituals where this is something that everybody gets to um, participate in more so than often, more often than not, is the rituals of uh, uh, of exhilaration, of celebration. Whenever you have rituals that involve ecstatic dance, drumming, things like that, this is where. Participation builds our energy. Oh my gosh, how many of you have ever been to a festival and been involved in a ritual where an element of, of trance, of dance, of something was uh, involved that just oh, – you get taken away? I have been to uh, festivals where I have literally seen licks of fire. Blue fire dancing off of people's head, and you know why that I was able to visualize that and to see that because everybody was in tune. The gods were there. It, you know, I think the gods that we follow keep an eye on us. Their energy is with us, whether we know it or not. And I think we get kind of the thumbs up, as it were. Magical forces go. We like these people. This is what's going on. They're working some great stuff. So those that have the vision. Those that have the ability to see, those that have the openness within their spirit, within their own energy centers are the people that are going to be – as they're dancing, they're going to be going, holy crap. And it's a good thing. You're happy. You're in tune with your brothers and sisters. There's no strife. This is the great big flashing sign, perfect love and perfect trust. This is where it comes together because how many people – you know, in a circle situation, have experienced it. This is what you want to experience, and when you do that, you get the ability to be joyous. You get the ability 
to you know revel in who you are in the men's mysteries when you have a great ritual with the men you get to feel the power of being a man the the connection that men have to the forest and the animals and the earth whenever you are in a men a woman's mysteries uh ritual you get to feel the sisterhood of of, of the women that are with you you get to relate to your place as a mother of the earth, your connection to the mother earth, your connection to the goddess. It it all flows together. Ritual has a purpose. It, it's it's all interconnected. And every ritual I right now as we speak, as this show is going on, it's almost seven fifteen where I'm at, somewhere in the country there's a ritual going on. Somewhere in the country surrounding us, there's a ritual going on. Everywhere, someplace around the world, there is a ritual going on. And I believe that all of those rituals, regardless of what they are, have some kind of connection to each other. The ones that are going on at the exact same time, there's a dot here. You ever seen the, the comic – or not comic books, coloring books with the connected dots? There are hundreds of places – that pagans and those that are pagan but may not necessarily uh, you know, uh, avail themselves to it, we connect. That is so cool. All over the earth, we are connected by our ritual. We are connected by our, our beliefs. We are connected by the traditions that we follow. So you know, these celebratory things that we do, whether it's a Sabbath or if we're celebrating a, a life passage – when a boy become, becomes a man, when a girl becomes a woman, um, and you know, some people say, well, as you get older, who would want to celebrate becoming a sage or a crone? I'm getting close to that. I've got five years, and I'll be 50, and you know, so I feel that change. I feel those times coming, and you know what I'm going to do from now until that time comes? I'm going to ritualize it. I'm going to celebrate it, and once I hit that milestone, I'm going to continue to ritualize in my life and move on to my final passage because that's what the, – the series of things that we do in our path and the way that we walk within paganism regardless of our tradition is what's going to shape our character and shape our spirit for our next incarnation, and uh, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to learn about ritual. To learn about our place in it, and for those of you that are scaredy cats out there that, that won't even perform a simple ritual, start slow. Do something small. Start with the smallest component of something, something that is so obscure that you can see within a ritual that you can say, well, that ain't going to hurt. That's not going to hurt me, and do that, and then once you've done that, then you add on to it till eventually… One major thing has happened. You have done all the components for a ritual that works for you as a solitary or invo by involving yourself in a ritual that works for your Coven Grover group. You learn the importance of it, and you become less afraid of it. And one of the best things about it is our energy gets built up so much. Like um, you know, we talk about psychic abilities being like a muscle. It doesn't get any bigger unless you you know work out and, and eat right and all this stuff. Well, it's the same way with ritual practice, uh, you know. And rituals give us a chance to be creative ourselves. We're going to talk about the solitary side of some of these things. This is where you get to figure out what works for you. You get the chance to sit down with your book of shadows or grimoire or whatever it is you have. And you know, think of the things that are important to you, what things are important to you in ritual, how the gods are important to you, what gods and goddesses um, work for what you want to do at that specific moment. And, um, or if you have a, a matron or patron god and goddess specifically, how do you want to work with them? And then once you get it all figured out, find out where it is that you want to do it, if you're going to do it in your home or at a national park or what have you. And get out and do it because once you do, I'm telling you, I was scared whenever I very first came into paganism. Rituals scared the crap out of me. The very first ritual I ever went to, I asked a friend of mine after it was all over, and I didn't really know. I knew nothing about paganism or, or, or magic or nothing real, and I said, are you guys Satanists? I said that straight up, and the guy goes, no. 
And the thing that was cool, though, was after I said that and the guy said no, we went down to the camp, and they explained it to me. They took the time to set me down and say this is what's going on this night, and specifically that very first ritual that I ever attended was a Samhain ritual. And they explained to me what was going on. They explained to me to the, the, the you know what was going on with the change of the season, the the new year, the veil between the worlds, and that stuff excited me. That's another thing. Ritual can be exciting. Ritual can you know uh, make our juices flow, and you know I didn't know that. That was a little bit of a pinprick. Something saying, hmm, this is interesting. This is something I want to check into. And when I did my first solitary ritual by myself before I initiated into the coven that I was involved with, it was like the proverbial light went off over my head. I don't know how many of you have ever had that experience, but it's just like one of those things that stick with you. I still remember my first ritual. I've been involved in paganism now for over 20 years, but I still remember my first ritual. I remember my last ritual. My last rit ritual ritual was at Samhain. I've done some meditations and some other things since then, but you know, and that's one thing. It, it leaves a mark on us, and this is our way of leaving a mark on others. You know, whenever you are a priest and priestess of a ritual, you are kind of leaving a legacy of your tradition. You're leaving a legacy of your service to the gods, and um, you're you're. You're shaping minds. You are you're, you are imbuing your energy to the people that uh, worship with you. I mean, you know, some of the greatest things that that you will ever do as a priest or priestess, as an example, is initiations. And we've talked about initiations before. We're not going to go into the full scope of it, but the ritual act of taking someone into your group and you know acknowledging them for one as somebody that you would like to see learn and grow within your tradition that's one aspect of it but i think the best aspect of it for men and for women is the fact that we know this is the path we want to follow there's no him on around about it or thinking you know i can't do this once you step into that circle uh, with you know with the cords and you're blindfolded and things that are going on you know and then after you step out that whole experience changes you, and that's the one thing. Initiation isn't about what happens with the priest and priestess in the circle. It's about the change that, that takes place within your spirit and your mind and how that first initial connection, real connection to the gods and goddesses feels to you, how it resonates in your spirit. And uh, that's one thing that I recommend if… You have been initiated or are about to be initiated within a Coven Grover group. Take a portion of your Book of Shadows or Grimoire and write down your impressions of what went on. How did you feel? Some people are elated. I had a friend of mine that she was initiated into an all-women's coven, and afterwards you know, she wrote at least seven pages in her Book of Shadows. And you know, uh, I just didn't want to go against any of her oath-bound material, but I just said, in one word, you know, can you sum up the experience? Um, you know, and she had a big smile on her face, and then she goes, "Well, I can't. I can do two words: deep, because it just touched her really deeply, and connecting. I mean, it's just like whenever you take a." Uh, wire and you bring it together, and those those sparks of electricity start to go through that line. You know the connection. That's what we're about, and you know we we have the ability to pass this on to so many people. So if somebody asks you about elements of ritual and they don't understand, help them out. Help them kind of figure things out. That's what I've had to do with a couple people here with here in the last year. Uh, one guy that just didn't get it, didn't understand, and we talked through some emails, and once he called me on the phone, he was from out of state, and I just took the time and said, this is what it's all about. And now I've gotten a couple emails from him since that not only has he really got the gist of what ritual is all about, <clears throat> but he's experienced it himself. He's done rituals. He's went to a couple coven meetings in a place where he lives now. And he's looking into other traditions. He doesn't necessarily know if this is going to be the tradition that he wants to be a part of, but at least he's been exposed. 
because you know that's how we find ourselves. You know, you may be uh, a full, fully into the eclectic witchcraft thing. You may be fully into the Dianic or whatever tradition, but you have to find that. And one of the biggest ways that we find our path is the experience of the rituals that we go to. You don't really get the gist of it by just sitting around somebody's house and talking. You get the gist of what their connection is by stepping in the circle with them and experiencing the whole thing, the entire enchilada. And yeah, so ritual is really, 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 really important and really cool. And we've got some more to talk about, but my throat's kind of getting scratchy, so I'm going to get something to drink, and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of music. And if you're out there listening, come and join us. All you got to do is come to www.blogtalkradio.com and join us. And if you want to add your experiences uh, to the mix, please give us a call. I haven't had a call in about four weeks. Um, you know, This is a talk show. It's not just all about me talking. I want to hear from you. So the number to call is 714-364-4316, and we'll be back here in just a few. We are alive, 
From the belly of the mother. I'm your host, Reverend Savannah Streetwalker, the Order of Standing Oak, and you are listening to Pagan Perspectives on a Monday night. Um, we're talking about rituals, and there's having a conversation in the chat room that I find is very important. Uh, uh, some of the books and things that are out there, some of the authors that put things out there uh, for the community. And yes, there are a lot of 101 books. Uh, one thing that I highly recommend is you know, if you're going to look at something new that's put out, Thumb through it, read the first chapter or the first half of the chapter, and get a feel for it. If it doesn't jive with your uh, reading style or if there's just something that doesn't jive, then don't pick that book up. I'm one of those people that kind of looks at the roots of things um, from uh, an, an, an older but more modern standpoint of um, the beginnings of ritual traditions in the United States specifically. And we can go back to the late 60s and early 70s, and two books that I highly recommend uh, are A Book of Pagan Rituals by Herman Slater, and uh, which was uh, some of the old uh, New York, uh, you know, uh, you know, Albert Court, Gardnerian kind of stuff that had been changed over. And then there's also another book that, you know, and these two, you know, are not necessarily, you know, uh, tied to anyone, uh, in, you know, here's – uh, tradition, but there's still a good point to use as a reference. You know, if you don't do anything that's involved in any of them, at least it gives you an idea of of uh, 
you know what it is. The other book that I highly recommend that you guys give a, a look into is called Magical Rites from the Crystal Well. And these were the old pagan way rituals that were done by Ed Fitch and some uh, other folks uh, back further in the day. And if you're looking for something that uh, deals with certain types of rituals, specifically a very good book that has some great uh, – um, connotations for hand fastings and some of the service rituals that I was talking about, and I don't know if it's still in print, but you can look for it on Amazon or some of your other bookstores and stuff. You might be able to find it, might be able to find it. It's a book called Circle of the Cosmic, Cosmic Muse by Mariah K. Sims, and it's a big, thick book. That one you're going to go th take a long time to go through, but it has a lot of great information. And then just in general for ritual structure um, by itself, you have Buckland's complete book of witchcraft, which is Big Blue. Or if you're looking at a traditional standpoint um, that goes beyond the general witchcraft, is the, his book that came out in 1973 called The Tree, A Saxon Guide uh, to Witchcraft, which gives us tradi the tradition, CX Wicca. So, you know, and these all focus heavily on ritual and uh, it's uh, what it pertains to uh, in seasonal things and stuff like that. And it can give you a real sense of what it's coming from. Because, yes, there, like we've been talking here in the chat room, there are people that when they write, they don't know their ass from apple butter. You know, they just regurgitate what somebody else has. Um, but then you have authors that really take the time to study and to learn about the, the culture of, of, of ritual, not just here in the United States, but our own cultural rituals that have come from Ireland, Scotland, Africa, Australia, all these different places. And those are the people that you want to be checking to, checking into. Those are going to be the ones that are going to steer you in the right direction. Also, always work within the construct of what interests you. You know, if you're into Dianic ritual, but you know somebody tries to pass you off a as a true ritual book, you probably don't want to read that. You want to go find something by Jishana Budapest or some other people that are involved within the Dianic movement, um, or if you're involved in the workings of, of the fairy tradition, you might look up some of the work of Keithorn Coyle or the book uh, uh, Thorns of the Blood Rose by Victor Anderson, or Fifty Years in the Fairy Tradition by Cora Anderson. You have all these different avenues to look. But also, like uh, people have been saying, you know, uh, and like I've been saying, is you've got to watch the hucksters. There are a lot of hucksters out there in druidic writing um, and stuff, specifically the two guys that really get my goat the most are uh, Douglas Monroe and Tag McCrossan. You know, just uh, they really grate me the wrong way. Twenty one lessons of Merlin should be should be used for toilet paper, not for reading. You know, that's just my opinion. But you know, we learn it, and uh, we talked about this the other night in in uh, spell working and stuff. And we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight. I think also within a ritual context, uh, the involvement of not just ourselves but our kids. If you're a parent. This is where you get to be, even though you may not be a priest or priestess of a coven grower group, you still have responsibilities within your family, and this is where you can really shine. Uh, development of rituals for uh, your family, um, your kids, um, that whole thing. And I got a phone call, but I can't answer the phone while I'm on the computer, so they're just going to have to wait. But um, you know. Uh, one of the good authors that deal with things for uh, pagan families is Ashlyn, Ashlyn Ogaya. I hope I'm saying that right. O G A E A. So it's Ashlyn Ogaya. Um, also is Kristen Madden. Um, great books by them. The, the some of the titles escape me, but if you type into Amazon or what have you, you can um, find them and check out some of their books. So and. That's the other thing. After once it circles around, the creative thing is write your own rituals. Create the own structure for your house, like I was talking about earlier, um, you know, and see how it works. 
sometimes you're going to do stuff in ritual that you're going to be scratching your head afterwards going, okay, maybe that didn't work. But that's what it's about, trial and error. And the stuff that really works, perfect it. The stuff that is effective for you, um, you know, techniques that you might employ during uh, operations such as drawing down the moon. Drawing down the moon is an important operation that just you can do it yourself. You don't have to be with a coven, but if you are with a coven, be very mindful and 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 pay a whole lot of attention to what goes on during that ritual if you're a person that's involved in that. Also, the rite of drawing down the sun. Um, other rituals that involve uh, longer amounts of time. There are rituals that uh, go over a span of a day um, from sunup to sundown. There are rituals that go over a span of more than one day, and that's where stamina comes in. Sometimes, specifically if we're doing anything that involves trance or ecstatic dance or focus uh, for a lot of things, meditations and stuff like that, it can be draining. So this can be a test of our body, of our mind. Um, ritual has purpose. It will always have purpose. Um, if it doesn't, then you know I think we might want to get into a different line of work as pagans. You know what I mean? It's like this is what takes us down the path. This is the car that drives us to the Emerald City. You know, Dorothy and Toto and them, they walk, but ritual is a car. It gets you there a lot faster than just using your feet. Um, and study, 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 you know, um, what do they say? The, you know, uh, look for teachers, but, you know, what like to say, when the, when the, when the teacher appears, uh, you know, the student should be ready. Well, that's one thing. If somebody just out of the blue just decides that they want to teach you something, take that with a grain of salt too. Now, if it's somebody that you know that is established and known in your local pagan community, give them a chance. But if it's some Joe Blow that you don't know, be careful. Here's an example. There's a guy here in town where I live that is involved in the pagan community and has been for years. But he has this way of finding innocent young women to say, well, I'll teach you this, and I'll teach you that, and I'll do this, and I'll initiate you in this tradition if you do this. So basically he tries to scam them by saying that he's going to teach them about the craft for sex. Be careful of that. I mean, if that's some, if there's, if there's some kind of physical connection, that whole kind of thing, yeah. But if not, run, run very fast and get away from that situation because all that's going to do is hurt you. To learn ritual, you don't need to be hit on or messed with by some lecherous dude. You don't. It just doesn't have to be that way. And uh, you know, and I, I want to put this out to you people, you know. What rituals have affected you the most? Has there been something that you have been a part of that whenever you left it, you were like, wow, I will never be able to experience that again ever? That energy, I'll never be able to experience it ever again just because of what it was, where it was, how it was. I like to hear about that. So if you've had any experiences like that, please feel free to let me know in an email. Uh, all you got to do is send it to Sylvanus93, S-Y-L-V-A-N-U-S-93 at hotmail.com, and I'd like to hear from you. And still, we've got some minutes left on the show, so if there's anything out there that you have as a question or you'd like to relate about how you feel about ritual, the number to call is 714-364-4316, and we're going to give you guys another little bit of music, and we'll be right back here on Pagan Perspectives.
something wrong. Searching 
Consort and drawing down the moon. I am your host, Reverend Sylvanus Tree Walker, the Order of the Standing Oak, and we've been talking about ritual. You know, we're going to do them. We're going to be in them. We're going to be involved with them, and uh, we're going to see it grow and change. You know, uh, we evolve. This paganism that we are experiencing now, the things that we do in circles and in our temples and in our homes and wherever it is that we're at, isn't going to always be like this. It's going to change. It's going to adapt. And eventually, a thousand years down the road, what we're doing now is going to be ancient, and whatever they're doing then is going to be new. So what you do and, and how you do it, make it count for something. Make it um, an extension of who you are um, with your group or as yourself because – it would be really cool to think that sometime, you know, in ancient time, or you know, further on down the line, that is, us being here in this ancient time, that somebody from that time could be digging around and find uh, somebody's book of shadows. It would be kind of highly impossible, but you know, or some kind of fragment of something that gives them an inclination of what we did, 
the rituals that were important to us and um you know the the, the rituals for women the rituals for men um all of our different things you know uh, there is so much that's out there, and there's so much that's going on. There are goddess rituals that are being birthed right now. There are uh, rituals of the god that are being uh, worked on and, and, and come together. And the energy that comes from it, the results of, of what we're trying to do with each ritual that we do, whether it's an honoring, whether it's a service ritual that we do for our, our people in our groves and our covens and stuff like that, they all have an outcome. Um, sometimes the outcome may not be that great. You know, Sometimes we do have rituals that hit the skids, hit the bricks, you know, and may not turn out so great. But who cares? You know, you move on. You, you brush that one under the thing. You learn from your mistakes, and you move on. And hopefully the next one that you do is going to be even better. And the one thing that i got to stress through everything is – you know, be consistent. You know, do the one thing I think that hurt me the most was there was a period where I literally went for a year without doing anything. I just got not necessarily burnt out, but I just felt like I was going in circles and I didn't really know what to think of myself and how I was doing and what was going on. And this was in between um, times of some things that were going on with the formation of the Order of Standing Oak. And I think recently, now that we're doing the show, now that I'm doing the show for you guys and stuff, it's like it's put me in a whole new mode of doing things. So I've been more mindful of what's going on whenever I do do ritual, I'm being more consistent about doing ritual on a regular basis instead of spacing things off just because you know I want to have a pity party or do whatever. You know, this takes commitment. Paganism is, you know, for some people, yeah, twice a week, twice a year witches, Beltane and and Samhain, You know, that's fine if that's what you want to do. But for those of you that have the, the drive and the commitment to be mindful of your spiritual path, then go for it. And if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask somebody for help. Don't be afraid to, you know, uh, get a partner to help you with some things. Practice makes perfect, and if you can't do it alone, maybe somebody can help you get to that space where it's all right. It's all right to do the things that you want to do instead of going, well, I'm afraid to do this. I might catch the house on fire, or I'm afraid to you know, uh, step in circle because I'm afraid I might vanish off into an alternate dimension or something like that. I've heard it. I've heard people literally say some of those kinds of things, so it's not totally impossible. And those of you that are priests and priestess out there of various traditions and covens and things like that, take your role seriously. Uh, I mean don't be so serious that you can't be human and live life and laugh, but don't screw it off. Don't just say, well, I can do this. I've literally known priestesses that will say, eh, we might do sow and we might not. What is that? You know, That is just – that boggles my mind. You Either you will or you won't, you know. It's not a might thing, you know, and it doesn't seem very pagan of me to, you know, have these people that depend on you as a spiritual leader, per se, and then have it get screwed off. So if you are a person that is a part of a covenant grove as a priest or priestess, live up to the expectations of your covenants, and you will have a much stronger group. The magic that you work will be stronger. The connection with the gods and things will be just incredibly, just unbelievable, you know. Um, and that's the way it should be. I think pagans, that's the way that we want to be. We want to be connected with everybody. And this show, that's why we have these episodes. We've got episodes talking about the coven, so you can check into that and kind of figure out some things from there. We've got shows talking about clergy. We've done a couple of good shows about that. So go back into the archives and check some of this stuff out. Because there, are, you know, there are ways to learn, and that's what this show is about. We want you to learn. All right. Well, it's about time to go. I want to thank everybody that's here. Let's see who's in the room with me. We have Alarian. Love you. Thank you so much for being here. Guest twenty-seven six ninety-eight. Guest thirty-five six eighty-seven. Guest thirty-five nine seventeen. We got Miss Radier, J.P. Plank, Catsliff, Lady Foxglove. Glad to have you here. Lavender Libra, as always. Snow Crash, A.K. Good to have you here. And Tia, it is awesome to have you guys here tonight. And like I say, we've got some great shows coming up. 
Wednesday evening for the Way to the Grove, the show by and for the Druid community, we're going to be talking about Celtic cosmology. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking with my guest, Priestess Kate Tarrant. We're going to be talking about pagans who occupy the occupied movement here in the United States and around the world. All right, got to go do something here real quick. Got something I got to find. I hope I do. There it is. All right, this is the Monday Night Show. I hope you guys have had a great week. Remember to get your uh, uh, sending in for Queen of the Night. It's our new Wiser Weekly Review book. Send in to get in for that. And we've got Raven Grimasi going to be here November 30th. So a lot of great shows coming up. I am your host, Reverend Samantha Tree Walker, the winner of the Standing Up, as usual. Goodbye until Wednesday. We can grow. I love you all. Bless me. Everything you need to ready, set, go back to school.